many good things for us, so many great things for us, and hardly know what to say, amen, hardly know what to say. Today, I'm taking a little break, every now and then something drops onto my heart that's so heavy that if I don't go ahead and say it, then I think I'm actually going against what God would have me to say. Oftentimes we, uh, we make our preparations and we do our studies and then sometimes at the last minute the Lord will just shelf it all and say that ain't where you're going today. <laughs> and so I want to talk to us today on something that uh, you'll notice in your bulletin there, kind of on the back side of it, there's some corrections and I'll share those with you when I get there looking at some of the challenges that are facing the church today. You know, there are many issues facing the church, and each one of those issues, they've kind of zapped the church of its uh, unique identity, of its power, and of its mission. We can't fix the problem until we have identified the problem, until we identified identify what has taken the power that the church once had, what has taken that away? What has caused the church to exist in the powerless state that it does today? Amen? You know, Jesus declared without reservation, upon this rock I will build my church, and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I submit to you that God is right. And we look around us and we say, well, what's going on? If the gates of hell aren't prevailing against the church, the only answer is maybe the church is prevailing against itself. We're shooting ourselves in the foot. And we're blaming the devil for it. Remember a few weeks, I kind of inserted in the message you know, the devil, as, a, as a, an example, I said, the devil's up there in heaven saying, pleading with the Lord, you know, I didn't do that. <laughs> you know, don't, don't hold that one against me. And he would be right. He's not doing anything. You know why? Because God said he can't. So if, if we've lost the power or if the power isn't flowing, then we've got to look somewhere else other than the devil. If the world, because God, Jesus says, I've overcome the world. If you and me, you've overcome the world. John teaches our faith overcomes the world. So when we look at where did our power go, we can't blame the world. Then something internal must be going on. Something else must be going on under our power and under our control that can reverse this thing and allow the power of God once again to flow through his people in such a way that that world out there will have no doubt that Jesus Christ ain't in the grave no more. They'll stop digging. Amen. They'll stop trying to find the, 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 the burial site because this church will once again be so alive, so alive that it's undeniable that them folks been with the Lord. <laughs> them ignorant folks, <laughs> them poor folks, them folks who don't have a command of the English language folk, them folk <laughs> done been with the Lord. My heart is real heavy on this issue. It has affected every part of my fiber thinking about, Lord, something's wrong. I tried to put it together on that little chart You'll see there under uh, where it says your sermon notes. Amen. And uh, as, we, as you see there, each one of those lines are leading away from a Christ-centered life. 
each one. And there's a question mark in the middle because the question mark says, what is the church? Where's its influence? Where's its power? Where is this Christ-centered life that you and I are supposed to be living? What has happened? We have to answer that question this morning. We have to come face to face with that question this morning. And we have to do something about it. Amen? This is not going to be some kind of legalistic sermon. No. It's going to be one that is designed to make us aware and to alert us to what the true condition of the church is. But then we want to narrow that down and say, we are the church. I want us to make believe we're the only church on the earth. There's nobody else out there but us sitting in here today. We're it. We're it. Because God's talking to us just that way. He's not talking to somebody that ain't here. Amen? So I want to get it out of our brain. I wish such and such were here. No, who's here needs to hear it. Who's here needs to act upon it. Are you with me? These issues that face the church begin, the power is lost because, number one, we have a, what, diluted faith, a diluted faith. You know, when we dilute something, we make it thinner. Amen? When we dilute something, we, we take away its original strength. We don't want its original strength, so we try to wean it down a little bit, ratchet it back, soften it up. Water it down. Amen? Because we, want, we don't want the full effect or impact of that thing to have its, have its, have its way. An adult, a, a deluded faith then, is one that has no power and has no strength because it's been diluted and mixed with something else. You mix faith with anything else, and the power is gone. Anything else. We've mixed our faith with worldly philosophy, haven't we? We've mixed our faith with, well, I just don't feel that yet. We've mixed it with so many things. Perhaps we've heard of the pharmacist a few years ago, back around 2001, 2002, outrageous. He was taking the, uh, medicine, prescriptions for, for chemotherapy for cancer patients, and he was diluting it, which means patients were dying prematurely because the chemotherapy was diluted. It didn't have its strength. It didn't have its power. It did not have the ability to do what it was supposed to do. He got 30 years for that. Because of the egregiousness of the crime, that there was no care for life. Church, you and I have a responsibility for people's souls out there in this world. And, and if we dilute our faith, how are they going to get saved? It's just that simple. This was a crime with this pharmacist. And all society cringed at, at the fact that someone would be so careless just to make a profit, just to get more money. How do you think God feels about a church that's diluted its faith? Just so it can live in comfort. Just so it can have its own way. Just so nobody will say anything rude to it. 
we want comfort. And we don't want to be moved out of our comfort. You know, Jesus said there's only two kinds of people in the world. He says there's the few and there's the many. And then he says, you know, he takes that and he boils it down to the church. He says, there are few who follow me, many profess. Many have watered down their faith. Yea, many have not even got the faith. Few exercise their faith. And we ought to be exercising that every day. Why? Because that's where the power of God is. I don't have no power. You ain't got no power. We don't need to be doing a jig in, in the middle of the sanctuary talking about I got the power. If you ain't getting somebody saved, you just dancing a jig. <laughs> That's all you're doing. You might as well go into the club and get the right music for it. <laughs> God's power, when it flows, somebody gets saved. Now, that's the kind of power I'm talking about. That's the kind of power that takes faith and flows through the faithful. Amen? Pluralism has, has zapped the church of its power. You know, that's the thought that all religions are kind of the same. And we just need to be nice to those folks and kind to those folks. Well, let me just tell you something. We, not, we certainly ought not to be rude to them. And sure, we should be kind, and we should be respectful, but we should also stand and not accept that which is wrong. If Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by me, we can respect their view but not accept it. Are you hearing me today? The problem is, with plural, pluralism and what we call ecumenicalism today, that's, let's just get together, is that in a pluralistic society, no one has to move but the Christian. Did you know that? He, the Christian is the only one who has to move because the Christian is the only one saying, my way is the only way. So in order to, to satisfy the various faiths or whatever out there, the church has to be quiet about the reality that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. All the other religions stay the same. They don't move. They don't change what they believe. They don't change how they practice what they believe. They're exercising more faith in nothing than we are in the real thing. We got to wake up to this church. We got to wake up to this reality that church is more than this here. This is important. It is critical. It is essential. But it is not all. It is not all. Another thing that is has diluted this, uh, our faith is this thing about unity without Christ. You know, every time we have a, a, a problem, a, a, a catastrophe, all the faiths, they come together, don't they? And they always talk about, let's get together. We need more community unity. I'm always asking, well, what you unifying around? He said, somebody help me out there, you know? What, what is this unity you want? We need to come together because if we come together, we'll solve the problem. No, you won't solve the problem. Because until you're at peace with God through Christ Jesus, you're going to continue to have a problem. Are you with me here? A third thing that's diluted our, our faith is worship. Worship is no longer about standing in the presence of Almighty God but it's making me feel good. Church, worship ain't about you and it ain't about me. I'm not here to feel good. I'm here to please him. When we leave here, he ought to be feeling good. Amen. 
He ought to be feeling good. I ought to be feeling, oh my, I got some work to do. I got some things to do. We have taken worship and turned it into no more than, than entertainment to where I feel good. I am not saying that worship is without feeling. But worship, true worship, is about what you know and what you believe. Did you know that? It's about what you know and what you believe. It is not about feelings at all. One of the things that the church has done, it, it's made it easy to bring the world into the church. Amen? I mean, I, I can go back to the days of Sam Cooke and James Brown and Aretha Franklin. That, yeah, amen? Amen? All that thumping and bumping and going on. And now, you know, we, we brought that into the church and we put Jesus on it. Y'all don't want to hear that, do you? And so now we can come. The transition in and out is a lot easier now. I don't have to really make no change. And so worship begins just like I'm at the club. That music makes me feel good. I can come into the church and I can feel good. And I can go back out there and I can feel good. When's God going to get his due? When, when do I, I express what I know before God and I fall on my face? You know, James says, turn your laughing into mourning. Look at Scripture. Show me someone that's just dancing and, man, they're just so light-footed in the presence of God. Everyone that I see, their face is down in the dirt, and, I mean, they are down before the presence of the living God. Do we have such liberty now? Oh, we ought to worship Him. I'm not saying that, but I tell you, most of what we're doing is not worship at all. Feel good sermons is a fourth reason why we're, our faith is the way it is. You know, people criticize your pastor because they say he, he preaches too hard. I get on my knees and say, Lord, I ain't preaching hard enough because folk ain't listening, see. <laughs> I, I, obviously, I'm not preaching hard enough, but some say, you're preaching too hard. You're going to run people away by preaching hard. You know what Jesus said about that? He said that the true seeker, we got these seeker churches now, you, you know what I'm saying? We got these churches, you know, they, everything they do is about the seeker. So they want things to be comfortable for the person that's seeking. Well, that person that's seeking is being offended by the gospel. So we dumb it down. We dumb the gospel down. Now listen to this. Jesus said in the last days, many will be offended. You remember the few and the many? Many will be offended. Now I want you to just think about this for a moment. The person who's seeking Jesus Christ, why would they be offended about the gospel? The person who's genuinely seeking Christ is not offended by the gospel. But the church has misinterpreted it. To say, boy, we can't preach that gospel because it's going to offend the seeker. What's the seeker see? Ask, what's he looking for if he ain't looking for Jesus? <laughs> Somebody help me here. I'm just, a, I'm just a simple preacher. You know, if, if he's a seeker, what's he looking for? Well, the church says, well, he's looking for a softer message. He's looking for acceptance. He's looking for his needs to be met. He's looking for this, and we've got to meet him where he's at. Well, that's all good and, and fine. But when we meet him where he's at, we better introduce him to Jesus Christ. What's this mess? Jesus said that's the sign of the times. The church is losing its faith. In other words, it's dumbing down its message. And it's saying, we can't preach the gospel anymore if we're going to draw people to Christ. How crazy is that? How nuts is that? I mean, that's what we're saying. 
And so now we've got Starbucks while the preacher is preaching. Lawn chairs. Emergent church says, hey, you don't need a pastor. You don't need a church. You don't need organized religion. Well, you don't need your arms either. Why don't you throw them away? <laughs> Why don't you throw your legs and your eyes away? God organized that body in such a way that it functions exactly the way it ought to function. God gave a church. He gave a structure for that church, a purpose for that church, and we want to throw it away. Faith deluded. Isn't that something? Christianity is not about being liberal or conservative. I'm sick over what I see in this election cycle, not from a political view, but from the fact that the church has become a political block. And it's not concerned whatsoever in that block to present Jesus Christ at all. But they have gone to the world and said, you are our best solution. Do you hear me today? You're our best solution. And Jesus is hanging on the cross saying, what about me? What about me? I thought I was the one that would solve your sin problem. Yeah, but my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my subjects, my citizens would fight for me. And we see evangelicals fighting for political clout. Jesus, help us. Help us. Deluded, dilutes our faith. Because we're looking not to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. But we're looking to the political system. Well, what should I do? I don't know what you ought to do. Maybe you ought to try following Christ. Maybe we ought to try that one for a while. I mean, after all, we're his people, right? Why don't we just try following Christ and let the politics follow the politics? Because best I understand, Jesus ran from the political system. <laughs> Amen? You say, Pastor, that's some, that is some hard preaching. When you've got to crack a rock, you need a, a good hammer. You know, some of us has been mesmerized by all of this, and we've taken it in, and we've heard somebody stand in the pulpit and tell us, well, you know, you need to just be a good citizen. You know, we got evil and evil too, and so you just have to get the less of the evil, but you need to exercise your citizenship. I'm here to say we need to exercise our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we need to do. Amen. Vote for him. Try it out. Amen? This world does not have the, solution, ha have the solution to the sin problem. And until the sin problem is addressed, the problem's going to exist in some form. And we all see it's getting worse. Amen? As a matter of fact, the Bible even told us, if, if you could, the world's getting, rest, uh, getting worse. It's not getting better. That, that, that the church is never going to conquer this world. That's not going to happen. I'm not a fatalist. I'm a believer. That's what I am. I'm a believer. And so, so I need to put all my energy. You need to put all your energy. The church of the living God needs to put all of this energy in, in, in walking in faith in every aspect of our life so that the people of this world will know there is a living God. There is a true and living God. We're just not another religion on this earth. You know something else? A second thing that challenges the, the church is pride. Pride. The scripture tells us in Proverbs 16, 18 that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The church is, the, the, the pride of the church, all, all we have to do some of us older folks will see it maybe a little bit more clear than some of the younger folk. Look where the church has fallen from over the last 50 to 100 to 200 years. I mean, it's just been on a steady 
decline. A steady decline. Why? Because of pride. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Pentecostal. I'm a Methodist. I'm an interdenominationalist. I'm a no denominationalist. Look who I am. Jesus said, you know what? You need to put me on. The scripture says, Paul says what? Put on Christ. You know why we wear labels? Because we cannot stand without them. Let that soak in. Anybody with common sense knows that the only reason you put a label on something is to separate it from something else. That, there's no other reason to put a label there. If it's all the same, then you don't have to put a label there. Now, I'm not, I'm not foolish enough to believe that all denominations are going to go away, not even preaching that. What I'm saying is that in our hearts, we ought to, we ought to be serving one Jesus Christ. And, and let, here, here's the kicker. Anything that interferes with unity in Christ, we ought to lay it aside. And we're unwilling to do that. Why? Because of pride. My daddy went to that church. My mama went to that church. My granddaddy went to that church. My great-granddaddy started that church. I ain't moving from that church. I don't care how bad it gets. I'm staying. I believe some people are going to be sitting up in church singing Nero, my God to thee, when the rapture comes. They're going to start at verse 1. The rapture going to come. They're going to be able to finish verse 4. <laughs> And in verse 2 and 3, the rapture going to come. They're going to be still sitting there, unaware, unaware, unaware. Someone once said that the best safeguard against spiritual pride is remembering one's own sinfulness. Keeping our eye on our own sinfulness will knock out all pride. It will not make us better, uh, feel like we're better than somebody else. Pride is the heart's, I believe, greatest deception. Why? Because, because one, it causes one to think there's somebody that they're not. In other words, uh, pride causes someone to believe the lie it's telling itself. That's what pride does. <laughs> Amen? That doesn't come from without. Matter of fact, nothing on this list is an outward thing. It's an, in, it's an in, in, inward thing. I've got to change inside. I've got to look at my heart from inside. Pride does not admit it needs help at any point. But it tries to plow through. It's gonna, I can do it on my own. Isn't that worldly? Isn't that worldly? I'm not going to reach out and say, you know, I can't do it. See, that's what pride does. And then, and then we go and mess it all up. Amen. Now everybody knows you can't do it. <laughs> Hello? The world's telling us to be all we can now. Well, go ahead and be all you can now. What you going to do later? I, I have a message I like to preach when I'm doing funerals, and many have preached it before me, and when I'm in the grave, I'm sure it'll continue. It's in Hebrews 9, 27. It says that uh, it is appointed unto us once to die. You know, and, and then afterwards, the judgment. And folk walk all around that word afterward. <laughs> and I like to hone in on afterwards. After you've been all you can be, now what? After you've won a thousand medals, now what? After you become a billionaire, now what? After you die, now what? Somehow, and everyone sitting in this church, from this pulpit to the last seat, has to wrestle with pride. Pride is at the core of the sin nature. At the core of the sin nature. And we've got to fight pride. We, pride is the thing that makes us, that, that, that causes us to steal God's glory. That's what it does. God's doing something great in our life, and we're going to take credit for it. That's pride. And what does pride do? It zaps the power of God. A third thing that we see here, and 
if you're kind of following along on your sermon notes in the bulletin, that should be no moral absolutes. No moral absolutes. Romans 1.25 says we've changed the truth of God to a lie and we worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Absolute truth is truth that transcends every culture, every ethnicity, every all time, and every experience. It's absolute. It doesn't change. Cultures change. Amen? But the Word of God does not change. The lapse of moral uh, 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 absolutes see the Bible as more or less a guideline. And this is where the church has fallen. It's a guide. You don't want to get too legalistic in obeying God. Now, I want you to think about that a little bit. You see, if somebody calls you a legalist, you wanna, we, we want to back up. What they've just done is said, well, wait a minute here. You can just be a Christian, but you don't have to obey. Because if you obey, that's too radical. You're being too legalistic. Now, that, that, there's some legalism going on out there. Now, there ain't no doubt about it. You know, legalism says that, you know, if you do this and you do this, then, then you're okay. You do this, you do this. And so everything is outward, outward. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about folk who will look you and me in the eye and call us legalists because we believe what God has said in his word and we're doing everything we can to, to obey what he says. And it's, it's costing us something and it's shining light on them. And they don't want that light on them. See, you and I shine light. <laughs> he said, whatever is light exposes darkness. You don't have to tell them they're in their sin. When you stand around them, the light comes on. They say, you got to go. Don't have to say a word. Whole demeanor is different. Everything about you is different. God says, I've made you light. I've made you salt. Hmm. So far as moral absolutes, we have come to the place where every individual has become a free agent. Individual rights supersede moral absolutes. Don't tell me, if you're convicted of that, you go ahead. I ain't convicted of that yet. Well, do you believe that's true? Yeah, I believe that's true. Then you're convicted. <laughs> you're just not converted. <laughs> Are you with me here? <laughs> you know, folks, they, they can be convicted of the truth. Doesn't mean they're converted by that truth. A lot of people bothered when we bring the gospel. It's not because they don't understand. It's because they do understand, and they're under conviction. You remember old Felix? I think that's who it is. If not, you put the right name in, you know. Old Paul came to him, and he, he got to talking about the, the power of God and all that says, and he trembled. Don't you think that's conviction? <laughs> he was under heavy conviction, but he said, Paul, you are crazy. You come back. You almost persuaded me. That's conviction without conversion. They understand. He understood. That's why I was shaken. <laughs> Isn't that something? Moral absolutes. In this non judgmental world, everyone gets to be right. No one is really wrong, it's just a mistake. <laughs> They, they're a little confused. Oh, they just didn't know, know better. Oh, it's their great, great, great granddaddy's fault. He was a drunk. When do we stand up and say, I'm, I'm accountable for what I do? But see, where there are no moral absolutes, nobody is held to accountability. I don't want to be held to accountability I'm not going to hold you to accountability. Evil in this kind of a construct is reduced to a concept. You, you ever notice on the news, they, if somebody talk about something being evil, boy, they fall all over themselves. Saying, no, you can't say that. That's judgmental. 
And the church is bought into that. I'm telling you, same-sex marriage is nothing but evil. It is a horrible abomination against God. Just like is adultery. Is an abomination before God. Let me tell you something about adultery. My study in Proverbs there, you know, it says the adulteress, if you catch the adulterer and the adulteress, the penalty for that is death. It's amazing, isn't it? But the penalty for a prostitute is just to cast them out of the congregation. It's not death. Now, why do I bring that up? You see, we're in this society now that says a little bit of on the side is okay. And we don't look at that as adultery anymore. We see folks, you know, divorcing like this for no reason at all, talking about we can't get along, marry somebody else. Christian folks! Why? Because they're no moral absolute. Nobody wants to work through anything anymore. It's easy to cut and run. And my question is, what are you running to? You just packed the bag of troubles, zipped them up, threw them in the car, went where you are, took them out of the car, opened them up, and the trouble's still there. Work it out. Work it out. And if you can't work it out, then just say, Lord, I'm staying no matter whether it changes or not. I'm going to obey you. It doesn't matter what that old wife does. It doesn't matter what that old husband does. I am going to stick it out with you. <laughs> Hello? That's what I'm going to do. My faith ain't based on what you do. It's based on what I do and vice versa. Hello, are we still together? You know, we hardly know today what Bible to buy. There was a time when we went to a store to buy a Bible, and you know what was on the cover of that Bible? Does anybody, probably don't even remember. There were only two words on that cover, Holy Bible. Now you got it. You got Dr. So and so's name on there. This is my Bible, and Dr. So and so, and this is my Bible, and Dr. So, and this is my Bible. So we pick all these and say, Well, they help us. And then we get to sitting around a table and say, Well, my Bible don't say that. <laughs> well, but, but my Bible don't say that. My, well, such and such says this, and such and such. When are we going to start following Jesus? Hello? He can work out those discrepancies, see? I don't need a scholar. I need Jesus. I need the Holy Ghost who's the spirit of truth and I need to be willing to work through it. And if I can't get a resolution to it, I just put it on the back burner and say, Lord, I got a whole basket full of stuff here. I understand. I'm going to start working on that. I'm going to start applying what I know and maybe what I don't know come to me. And that's exactly what Paul said. He said, walk into where you have obtained, and if God wants to reveal something else, he'll reveal it as a result of you walking in what you know. You can't do trigonometry and you don't know one and one. <laughs> now, I'm going to just tell you that. You can try to understand trigonometry all you want, but if you don't know one and one, you're not going to get far. But once you learn this, and you learn this, and you learn this, and you learn this, then you're equipped to learn something new. We ain't using what we got. I call that biblical illiteracy because we don't understand the seriousness of the book that we carry around with us week after week. That that's the very word of God. Amen. We don't have to listen to them folks that say, well, maybe some of them copiers got it wrong. Maybe this, they got it this wrong. And, and well, in here, some of that, you know, that it's italic. So that meant, that's not a direct translation. Well, this one is that. And that. You get Jesus inside. He'll settle the, the whole issue. Amen. Folks, used to, I used to be on that bandwagon. Well, King James is the only, the only version. You know, I got saved in a paraphrased Bible. 
I would no more stand up here and preach from that today than a man in the moon. But you see, I didn't get saved just through a translator. I got saved because the Spirit of God directed my understanding. The Spirit of God revealed to me Jesus Christ. That's how it happens. Paul says, have we, have we begun in the flesh, in that, I mean in the Spirit, now are we matured in the flesh? I'm not saying there's nothing, there's something inherently wrong with, with, with these Bibles that try to help us along and this sort of thing, but we're using them to divide ourselves, church. We really are, because we're unwilling to prove out who's right. Not that person, not this doc, not that PhD. He's right. He's right. I am the truth. He's right. Not in what he says, but in who he is. Are you with me? <laughs> so because of who he is, everything he says is right. <laughs> A fifth thing here that the church has to face is where causes are replacing evangelism. Causes are replacing evangelism. My kingdom is not of this world, Jesus said. The church has lost all vision, call it what you want, purpose of why we're here. We fight with that to this day of what we're supposed to be doing. We'll run to a rally. We'll run to this cause. We'll carry the signs uh, for, for this and for that. Let me read a quote here that I thought it struck me as interesting from Brad Vandenberg. I don't even know who he is, but I like the quote. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about who this guy is. I don't know the quote's good. The church needs to quit talking quite so much about visions, plans, strategies, new teachings, authors, bands, missions, buildings, teams, heresies. Just start being the heart, hand, voice, and compassion of the body of Christ. Whew. I said, I'm not going to mess with that. That's all we need to be. And in order to do that, you know, there's some things that we're going to not do. I got to tell you something, church, and I, I don't want to sound callous. And I don't want to sound un incompassionate. But much of what the church does, the world can do. What the world can't do is tell people about Jesus. I'm not going to get into the list of things because then I think we might be distracted in mind and I, I may be misunderstood certainly we ought to help folks certainly that ought to be an outcome of who we are but that ought not to be our cause that ought not to be our cause we have political causes social service causes there's actually a social gospel you know started out in mexico and has drifted up here into oh that was a long long time ago and there's a lot of preachers some of my friends will tell me when I, talk, when I start talking to them, they need to leave that social gospel alone, start preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because there ain't no power in the social gospel. What the social gospel says is get out there and feed the world. Get out there and solve all the world's problems. And maybe, maybe they will come to understand that Jesus did it. They're going to understand that Jesus did it because I tell them about Jesus, not because I do something for them. They're going to know because my life reflects the power of God through the gospel and how it's changed my life. Amen? Doesn't matter how many people we feed, if, if they come to my house as a preacher and, and lock me up because I'm embezzling from the church, hello? Heart problems. We have pro-life causes, racial causes. I'm sick of this stuff. I'm sick of it. Amen? I'm real sick of it. <laughs> I do a lot of genealogy studies and stuff like that just because it's interesting. 
But my friend, I just want to let you know, if you're black, if you're white, if you're yellow, brown, or whatever's in between there, we follow the Jesus Christ. We have our own ethnicity. We got our own culture. And it ain't nothing like this world. And we got to show it to the world. Somebody help me now. You hear that? I'm not carrying no signs. I don't care what anybody thinks about it on one side. Of, I ain't carrying no sign. To, I ain't going into any of that. But I ain't carrying none. <laughs> okay? My purpose on this earth, your purpose, the church's purpose on this earth is not to make things better here. It is to get people saved because things are better when they're in Christ Jesus. Ten trillion. If that's inaccurate, look it up and find the number for yourself. But I think it's around that number, and that's an old number. That have been put into resolving uh, poverty. (laughs) Somebody said that $16 trillion, you could put it end to end and it would go all the way back to the time of Jesus in here and we still wouldn't have spent it all. If $10 trillion didn't fix the problem, the church ought to come to realize maybe it can't be fixed by throwing money at it, maybe there's a deeper problem that needs to be solved. Souls need to be saved. Don't hear me to say we should turn our back because the scripture says you turn your back on the poor, God will turn his back on you. That's not the issue that I'm addressing today and I think we know that. We know that. Amen? Nobody's telling, standing here and saying, don't go out and help nobody. Don't do this and do this. I'm saying the church has lost this way running after movement, movement, environmental causes, this cause, that cause, and we're still here. And the church is still dwindling in its influence. It's still, it's still losing its power because we're not we're more concerned about the physical needs of people and, 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 and absolutely have no concern about their spiritual, which is eternal. No concern. You see, if I'm concerned about their soul, out of that comes a whole bunch of stuff. Amen? Out of that comes a whole bunch of stuff. We have fallen in the trap, says another, of believing in a cause more than faith. That's thing I want to tell us about this morning, I'll finish it up tonight if y'all will come on back and hear it, is a crisis of honesty. A crisis of honesty. If there's one thing that we ought to be, that, 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 that ought to be obvious to all of us, is that there's a serious crisis of honesty and integrity floating around. From the pulpit on back. Men aren't standing up in the pulpits anymore preaching the word of God. They're, they're, they're in the political movement so that they can stand in the, polit- in, in the pulpit and be a political power to control people. Jesus wants, doesn't even want to control you. Did you know that? I bet we don't know that. God doesn't want to control you. You know why? He gave you a will. <laughs> he gave you a will. He doesn't even want to do that. He says, if you follow me, you've got to do that voluntarily. And yet we got guys that stand where I stand, and that, they want to control everybody through political power dishonest dishonest honesty is not it, 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 it is is not bearing false witness against our neighbor <laughs> now that would include the, the gossip the slander the indu- in, in, innuendo the false perceptions we have about people that comes from an evil heart you know math uh, mark 7 uh, 21 t- says that evil thoughts evil thoughts 
That comes from here. Evil thoughts about people. That comes from within. And it says that defiles a person. That messes people up. Amen? That's not being honest. Flattery is not being honest. Now, you just got to figure a way, you know, when you look at that hat, you got to figure a way to say, well, you know, it, it, you think it's good. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you got to figure that out now. You know, you got to use some wisdom here. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> honest people aren't deceitful people. Honesty is letting our yes be yes and our no be no. Honesty is telling yourself, and this is the most important, honesty is telling yourself the truth about yourself. We have, we have fooled ourselves long enough. And we've become better in our own eyes than what God sees. Amen? Now, I, I know some of us will be thinking, well, you know, I'm okay. I mean, I know I'm messed up, but when God sees me, you know, he just sees Jesus Christ. Well, that well may be true, but he ain't overlooking. Don't mistake that for God overlooking sin in our life. You know why? Because if he only, if he only, and I underscore, only saw us through the eyes of Jesus, he would never chastise us. He would never correct us. He just let us live the way we live in, in Christ. Wrong, full of sin. But the fact that he corrects us, he chastens us, says that though he sees us in eternity in the eyes of Christ, he sees us now where we are and he will not let us just walk any kind of way and live any kind of way. Amen? And we got to be honest with ourselves about that. He that is born of God cannot sin. Why? Because the seed remains in him. I can't have Jesus Christ in me and I'm just living this. I can't do it. Not because I'm incapable, because God said it. Are you with me? He said that can't be because he has taken charge. Oh, great gugga mugga. Honesty. 2 Corinthians 13 tells us what? It says that to examine yourself, your own self, whether you be of the faith or not. We got to start doing that, church. We got to start minding our own spiritual business. We got our nose stuck in everybody's business. We want to run and tattletale on everybody and what they're doing. And, I, and we're hanging out. You know, the flap. You know, you go to the hospital in them gowns. You better make sure you tie them up or the flap be out, you know. <laughs> Whew. You know, we don't know our flaps out. <laughs> Are you with me here? See, we criticize somebody. Look at that. Well, hey, you better watch out. You just let go of your, your strings there. <laughs> I, I could go on and on, but I'm going to save some of this. I, I'm really moved because until we begin to see where the church is and, and, and where the leaks are and where the problems are, you know what we do here makes little sense, if any at all. It really does. You'll, you'll wear out, you know, church will wear out one, one pastor, bring another, wear him out, wear him out, and they just stay the same. It just stays flat. Yeah. We're looking to blame somebody else for what's wrong, but we're not willing to look in ourselves and say, have I committed myself to the Lord? Have I lied to myself when I said I give my life to you, Lord? Have I done that? I know he's given his life for us. That's not the issue. Have I given my life? And is there tangible evidence, not for anybody else, but for me, that I know 
by how I live my life, how Christ is working through me, how the power of God is working to help me overcome the challenges that come in my life, how my mind is being renewed daily, how I see myself dying to this and dying to that. I need to evaluate my own life against that to determine that faith is indeed in me. Why? Because James says faith produces a work you don't produce it i don't produce it faith produces a work in other words faith says it's an action god said it i'm going to obey that's faith when i obey the power of god flows through my life do you see that and that's faith at work i'm not preaching a works salvation because it's god at work in us to will and what church his good pleasure i must submit to that how do i submit through obedience how do i obey because i love him why do i love him because he first loved me Whew. we got to act on the things we've talked about today. We got to act as a, as a people of God in this place today. Member or not member of this church, doesn't matter. God is calling his people. And we got to decide whether or not we are part of the people that is hearing. He's calling. Are we part of the people who are hearing God? Because few, he said, are going to enter in. Many are going to claim to know him. Amen? Few are going to be followers of Christ who are going to walk in faith, not dilute their faith, who are going to have integrity and honesty, who are going to relinquish the pride that's in their heart who believe in the moral absolutes that God has given us to, to navigate our life through, to navigate through this life and who are willing to tell people about Jesus Christ because, because of what Christ has done for me, kind of like the, the Samaritan woman. He told me all about myself and I cannot help but tell somebody else. Amen. Now, I got to close with this because I'm just starting to get wound up again. If I get wound up again, you know how that's going to work out. <laughs> and that old gal went down there and she said, he told me all about myself. Some didn't believe. And you know what happened? They took off running to Jesus. She planted hope in their heart. That's what they said. It said, some of them believed her on the spot. The rest of them took off. Now, why'd they take off? Because she influenced them. So she was still successful. Because when they got to Jesus, they got saved. <laughs> That's what we got to do, church. Put our own life aside. And let's follow Christ. Stand with me. <sighs> Lord, you have attempted to wake us up again today and we got to thank you for bringing us in because lord father god and exposing us for who we are indeed you are showing us mercy you are showing us your your grace and your love for you speak to us lord god in time that we may turn you speak to us, Lord, while the heart is still accessible. You speak to us, Lord, before we run into ruin. Hear us then, Lord God, Father, and help us and heal us that we can be the church you want us to be, called us to be, and made us and equipped us to be. For every heart in here, Lord, Father God, that has received your word and hid it in their heart, show forth their might and your power, even in this day. Affirm 
and confirm your word in them. Those who, Lord, he may be on the fence, be the tug that causes them to fall on the side of Jesus. Any be here who don't know you, Lord, Father God, quicken their spirit and hear the voice that they cry out to you now to the saving of their soul. If there be anything else, O oh God, Father, we know you'll reveal it. This we pray and thank you for in the blessed name of Jesus and all who believe said, Amen and amen.